Welcome to the Homesteaders of America podcast, where we encourage simple living, hard work, natural health care, real food, and building an agrarian society. If you're pioneering your way through modern noise and conveniences, and you're an advocate for living a more sustainable and quiet life, this podcast is for you. Welcome to this week's podcast. I'm your host, Amy Fuel, and I'm the founder of the Homesteaders of America organization and annual events. If you're not familiar with us, we are a resource for homesteading education and online support, and we even host a couple of in-person events each year, with our biggest annual event happening right outside the nation's capital here in Virginia every October. Check us out online at homesteadersofamerica.com, follow us on all of our social media platforms, and subscribe to our newsletter so that you can be the first to know about all things HOA, that's short for Homesteaders of America. America. Don't forget that we have an online membership that gives you access to thousands, yes, literally thousands of hours worth of information and videos. It also gets you discount codes, an HOA decal sticker when you sign up, and access to event tickets before anyone else. All right, let's dive into this week's episode. Welcome back to this week's episode of the Homesteaders of America podcast. This week, I have Adam and Michelle Berenger. Welcome to the podcast, guys. Thanks for having us, Amy. You're welcome. I think, I'm not sure if we've ever had another couple on other than Sean and Beth. I think you guys are like the first couple that we've had on together. So that's fun. Um, Um, So today we're going to talk about, we've been going through a series on sheep. We've had a few podcast episodes about cows. But last year at our HOA women's event, uh, Adam and Michelle were talking about their herd shares. And I thought, you know what? They need to tell this story to the HOA community and how successful it's been for them. So we're going to get started in that. Today, you guys might get some questions answered if you're looking into herd shares. You can learn how the Behringers do it and all about them. If you don't want to do a herd share, you would rather buy and you're in their area. That's an option as well. So, all right, so let's get started. Tell everybody who you are, what you do, and how your family kind of got started, uh, what year, how long you've been doing it. Sounds good. <laughs> you want to tell our story? No, you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we got our first uh, milk cow, I guess about six years ago, five or six years ago, uh, just for our family. Uh, she was a Dexter Jersey mix. It's called a Belfair, if you're familiar with any of those mixes. But uh, she was a really good cow. That was a good uh, experience for us and our family and kind of went head first into dairy and didn't know what we were getting into. But uh, she forced us to learn. And and then once we had her, we milked her for, what, a couple months to start with. Mm -hmm. And then it was too much because I was traveling and Mm -hmm. uh, it was just a burden on you guys to take care of that. So we, we dried her up and waited till she calved. Uh, But once we started milking her again, all of our neighbors found out about us having milk. And uh, that's really how the, the milk sales and the the herd share started was uh, just kind of word of mouth and our neighbors, you know, learning that we had a dairy cow. So um, yeah, that's where it all started. Mm Mm-hmm. That's Mm -hmm. awesome. So you guys started in 2021-ish, is that right? When you started getting your herd share really in order? Yeah, that's when we purchased more cows was 2021. Okay. So what are you guys milking now? Are you milking jerseys? Are you still doing the crosses or a mix? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. We have two cows that are Jersey Guernsey mixes and the rest are jerseys. Okay. Yeah, we have uh, six cows total, six, six milking cows total and, uh, Two of those are mixes and the four, the other four are jerseys. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about how your herd share grew. Is it a really good sustainable income for you? And how did you get to where you are now? Yeah, I mean, it's been a a real blessing for our family. Back in, it was 21 when we bought uh, Cece and Maggie, Mm -hmm. our next two cows, and uh, really started seeing the need then. And then um, once you registered us on realmilk.com, that's when things started to explode um, mm-hmm. through the Weston A. Price Foundation. And uh, now we have uh, a larger demand than what we can meet. We're sort of maxed out with the amount of pasture that we have and um, the amount of land that our animals can carry and that kind of thing. But yeah, it's been a, it's been a blessing for our family and our kids uh, to get everyone involved and meet new people and, and provide our customers with a good product and something that really changes lives, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So what does your routine look like? So tell us a little bit about your family and how they're involved and what your typical routine for a herd share looks like. 
Go for it. Well, I'll, <laughs> well, you'll have to tell about the milking part because yeah. that's not my area of expertise. But um, well, I keep telling you, you got to start milking CC. <laughs> <is your cow. laughs> we have one cow who. Uh, is pretty feisty. If there's yeah. going to be uh, something that goes wrong, she's probably the cause of it. But I think yeah. she's really cute. And uh, and Adam and our oldest who milked them are like, well, you have at it because <laughs> she ain't so cute to milk. So, yeah. yeah, we our kids are all involved in the, in the dairy um, process in some way or another. Adam milks before he goes to work because he works full time at another farm as the livestock manager. Uh, So he milks before he goes to work and I bottle and I do all of the customer stuff, all of the member relations things. And so any kind of communication, I handle all of that. Then Stella, our next to oldest, uh, she is in charge of cleaning up all of the milking equipment, sanitizing everything, making sure everything's ready to go for the next milking in the evening um, since we milk twice a day. And then Travis, our oldest son, he is just available for whenever we need him. He helps me sometimes with washing the bottles that come in because we trade out. So our our herd chair members, we bottle in glass jars. And so they will return their jars from the week before. And then we sanitize it again before, obviously, before we bottle um, again. So he'll help me with washing those or milk rags that need to be washed um, that they use on the cows to clean them up. Um, He'll put them in the washing machine and get those out and hang them up to dry and all that kind of stuff. So all of our kids have a job to do. Sawyer, he, the little one, he's three, and he helps me with with washing and, mm-hmm. and whatever needs to be done. He'll hand me things and stuff. So. And Sydney. Sydney mm-hmm. does half the milking. S- Sydney, I guess I forgot because I was going to talk about the evening milking. But yeah. she, yeah, Sydney, our oldest, she's 13, and she has been in charge of milking in the evenings for quite some time. So she and Adam pretty much share the load of the actual physical you know, moving of the cows and milking the cows. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's an awesome little gig for a 13 year old, mm-hmm. huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's been really good for her or all of them. It's been really good for yeah. all of them. It's uh, it's one of those things you can't stop doing. Like they got to be milked every day. And so it teaches a lot of responsibility and perseverance through the hard times. And, you know, when, when you don't feel like doing it and those kinds mm-hmm. of things. So, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what your milking setup looks like, because you are technically a homestead herd share, right? And so you're, you may not necessarily look like a commercial dairy barn or anything like that. So what does your typical barn setup for milking look like? Yeah, it's uh, very simple. It's not anything you would think it would look like, really. It, you know, with us <laughs> being a dairy and, and we're milking several cows, so our barn is just, uh, it was a woodshed. That's what it was built for originally to store firewood in. And uh, when we moved here, it had wood in it and we actively used that up and uh, to heat the house with. Um, so it left a, an open stall basically. And I built a stanchion for our first cow and very simple, basically just a piece of wood that held her in place. It wasn't very fancy at all. And then once we bought... The two other cows, I uh, no, it was after that. Yeah, it was fairly recently that you built the, the yeah, two. Yeah, that's right. Two cow stanchions. I forgot about that. Yeah, <laughs> so once we um, started seeing a higher demand after getting on the Real Milk website, uh, we had to make things a little more efficient and streamlined. So I ended up we bought a, a two cow milker from Molasti. It's a fixed pump, so the pump it stays at the barn. And I have a, a two cow stanchion, and all that means is uh, just a wooden platform with rails on both sides and a space in the middle to basically sit on a bucket or, or squat or whether, whatever, and you have the two cows on both sides of you. Uh, yeah, it's very simple. And for the feed, I have a barrel up at the front with a hole in it that they can stick their heads in and eat while they're being milked. And then every day we have a, a wagon, it's our milk wagon, it's a little... Um, I don't know, just a wagon. We put the two tanks in and the claws and the hoses and we go to the barn and hook it to the pump and then hook it to the cows. And once we're done, we disconnect it all and bring it back to the house and bottle the milk and clean it all up and get it ready to go again. <laughs> so it's uh, it's very simple. Yeah. So are you milking all six cows a day or only a few cows a day? Yeah, we milk all six twice a day. 
And that okay. varies. Uh, sometimes, like right now, we're only milking four because two will be calving in a month or so. So um, we milk for about 43 weeks or so, and then we allow the cows to dry up for two months prior to calving. So it's anywhere from four to six cows a day, twice a day. Yeah. And how many gallons of milk are you getting a day from even just four cows? Yeah, we, we typically average average uh, three to four gallons okay. a day per cow. Good. Um, and do you guys have yeah. any, uh, so you'll see some smaller homesteads, they'll have like a chill tank. Do you guys have anything like that? Or you're just taking it straight to your house and sticking it in jars and in the fridge? Yeah, you want to? Yeah, we, um, it comes straight up from, from the barn, from milking. And um, I'm out there ready to put it into jars. And I have a um, big cooler with ice water in it ready to go. And so as soon as they're bottled, they go and chill down in the cooler. And then after they've chilled, then I put them in the fridge. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So let's, we're going to switch gears just a little bit. So let's talk about your dairy cow diet a little bit. What does that look like for you guys? I know it looks different for every farm and why do you choose the kind of diet that they have specifically for your cows? Yeah. So um, something I've been learning a lot about uh, this year actually is uh, it's called holistic management and uh, holistic planned grazing. Have you ever heard of that, Amy? I have. Holistic but management. Yeah. Go ahead and explain it just a little bit for those who don't know. Yeah. So that ties directly to our cow's diet, but we, re- we uh, really want to use the cows and all of our animals as a tool to manage the land to allow the pastures to recover and, you know, let the grass reach its full potential before grazing again. So um, our cows have a pasture-based diet. And with a dairy, we have to plan pretty much two spots per day. They go to a place after the morning milking and they stay all day and then we bring them back and milk them again. And then they they go to a different place uh, in the evening after the evening milking. So uh, sometimes that means we hold them in an area and we feed hay. But um, for the most mm-hmm. part, uh, they are pasture fed. And then we also, at milking, they get uh, it's roughly 10 pounds of grain uh, per milking. Maybe not quite that much, but that is a, a non GMO grain that's grown and milled here locally that uh, we have delivered. It's just a, the Fertrail Mineral Company. They have uh, livestock rations on their website, and we have a local meal make, make that up for us. Yeah, that's awesome that you're able to get that local. Mm-hmm. That makes a difference. We're able to get a lot of our livestock feed local too, which is nice. Yeah. Now, are you only feeding grain when they're in lactation, or are you feeding that all the time? Yeah, only when they're in lactation. Yeah, so once they, uh, yeah. uh, the two months before calving, we stop all grain and they really go to our porous pasture and kind of hang out. We don't, we don't keep them with the moving cows and, and give them the best pasture. And that a lot of that is to prevent uh, milk fever. So um, when you're drying a cow up, you're supposed to put them on pretty poor diet up until a week or two before calving and then put them back into the milking rotation. Okay. Awesome. So that's really good information for those of you that I know a lot of people, there's so many varying opinions, right? I'm like, should you do all grass fed? Should you do some grass fed? And I think it really depends on the cow and the family and how it works for you. Um, so I love that you guys are explaining yeah. that really well, like how you're managing those cows. And the ultimate thing is that they're healthy, right? right. And you definitely have healthy cows. I have seen them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we've had uh, some pretty bad experiences because we we started out with that mindset of uh, only grass fed and uh, only alfalfa pellets, uh, no grain. And we mm-hmm. we had some cows that wouldn't breed back. We had one cow that would fall all the time, and she was just given lots of problems, and I couldn't figure out why. And then it, I finally understood the difference in genetics and things like that. And, and cows of her type just require grain, you know, just to sustain her yeah. her body. So mm-hmm. once we saw that and saw the need for grain, it, it kind of changed our mind a little bit to uh, take care of our, yeah. our animals a little bit better and, and get out of that hard. You know, we're not going to do any any grain ever. I think it's a I think it's okay right. to give a small amount and and. You know, especially it's it's a locally grown and milled grain that, you know, I trust the, the source. So Yeah. And you nailed it. It's all about genetics, too. And so the thing that we try to stress to people here, especially is like if you're if you're buying a cow, especially a dairy cow, and they are not from, you know, completely grass fed genetics for generations, then 
you should take care of the cow that you have, not, not try to feed the cow that you want. Right. So it's just all about being a good steward and you guys are doing that really well. All right. So let's switch it up a little bit. What about raw milk? Tell us some health benefits of raw milk. Um, in case I'm, I think most of our audience knows, but there will always be someone who doesn't and they'll be wondering why on earth are you doing a raw milk herd share? Right. Right. (laughs) So raw milk is considered a whole food because it is completely natural. It is not stripped of any of its vitamins and minerals and enzymes. And I think the enzyme piece is, is key to it because so many people are labeled lactose intolerant. And I know I was one of those people that had never been able to really digest dairy. Um, And that was conventional pasteurized homogenized dairy. And after we started drinking the raw milk and noticing that I had no digestive issues, it was you know, pretty telling of that. And so we have, I mean, there's so many stories, like that's really what keeps us going. I think in this is Mm -hmm. just, it's just hearing the stories from our members about how they were lactose intolerant, or we have one member whose child was, was labeled failure to thrive. And um, they switched over to our milk and the kid started gaining weight and every time they would go to the doctor previously that they were losing the kid was losing weight every time and they were getting pretty concerned switched over to raw milk because the mom just just knew like we've got to do something to try to help him and he started gaining weight he got an appetite he started eating well you know and um just completely turned his life around there's so many crazy things i feel i mean i really feel like raw milk is healing and even with me i've had some uh, blood sugar issues i was wearing a glucose monitor for a while and i was having some really low glucose spikes uh, or, or dips during the night um like dangerously low it was considered and, you know, I was consulting with my doctor and nutritionist and they were, they were encouraging me to do protein before bed or a complex carb before bed. So I was trying different things, all healthy foods, all whole foods. And it was still, it was still dipping at night. Uh, and I was doing some reading and I read about, about people with some, some glucose issues, um, drinking raw milk before they go to bed. And I was like, well, let's give it a try. We've got it here. Let's give it a try. And I would, I drank a cup of raw milk that night and it was like this all night. And it had been ever since then. Um, and I, I remember telling my doctor that afterwards and she was like, that is some valuable information. Thank you for letting me know that. So, we just believe in it. We, we think that it's, um, it's just so good, uh, for people and, and for children who, you know, might lack some, some nutrients in their food or, or picky eaters or whatever. But if you can get them to drink their own milk, we feel like they've got a pretty good diet, you know? Right. right. <laughs> yeah. There's so much that goes to that too. Like the, the nutrition from the land, You know, there's so much that the cow gets from the grass and the soil that the grass is grown on that comes into the milk. So it really goes back to the way that the land has been managed and is managed uh, from what I've learned. That's uh, with a milk cow, that's an immediate thing. You know, today's grass is tomorrow's milk. So um, that's something that I've tried to get better at in the past uh, year at least, you know, trying to manage our cows a little bit better and making the grass of better quality. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And that's really important for people. You know, those of you listening, if you're looking for a herd share, it's really important to ask that herd share facilitator, you know, what, what are their cows eating and are they on pasture at all? And how do they manage their farm? And just their transparency is so important. And I, you know, we have no doubt that you guys are transparent because here you are on the podcast telling us all about it. (laughs) Hey guys, thanks for joining us for this week's episode. We're going to take a quick break and bring you a word from one of our amazing sponsors. McMurray Hatchery officially started in 1917. Murray McMurray had always been interested in poultry as a young man and particularly enjoyed showing birds at the local and state fairs. Nowadays, the hatchery is still completely through mail order, but they offer way more than ever before. From meat chicks and layer hens to waterfowl, ducklings, goslings, turkeys, game birds, juvenile birds, 
They even have hatching eggs and a whole lot of chicken equipment. Make sure you check out our Home Center of America sponsor, McMurray Hatchery at mcmurrayhatchery.com and get your orders in today. And don't forget to stop by their booth at the 2023 HOA event. All right. So we know raw milk is amazing. We know your cows are amazing, but we also know that there are some legalities in regard to herd shares in some states and your state is one of those states. So would you mind talking about that a little bit for those who may not know? Yeah. So, um, I don't know what the percentage or number of states, but most, most states it's illegal to sell raw milk. Do you know, Amy, how many, how many states is it legal in? It's very few, isn't it? It's, it's quite a few where it's illegal. And then there's states like yours and mine that either allow herd shares, um, or they don't have any kind of stance on herd shares. So like in Virginia, it's illegal to buy raw milk unless it's for pet consumption, which I'm not sure how they even monitor that, but they, my state in Virginia, we don't actually have a law on whether you can or whether you can't do herd shares. And so we're just up here in Virginia kind of getting away with, yeah. <laughs> with it. Yeah. So I'm not quite sure how what North Carolina is like, but generally if it's illegal in a state to sell raw milk, which most states it is, you know, I think there's only like five right. if that states where thinking. it's not illegal um, to buy raw milk. But in most of those states, you can do a herd share. Now, I do know that there was some talk going into the farm bill for next year where they're thinking about making a federal blanket for herd shares um, with some federal regulations, which we'll talk more about that as we get more information. But for now, the best place to check for each individual listener state would probably be the farm to consumer legal defense fund website. You can kind of check on there and see what your state rules are. If there are any rules And then Adam and Michelle are going to tell us how to get around those rules and how they're doing that. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah, so the two ways here in North Carolina we can sell milk is by labeling every jar as pet food and selling it as not for human consumption. Or uh, we sell through a herd share, which is simply our group of customers each own a portion of the herd. And so they may get an eighth of the herd or something and that entitles them to so much milk per week. And, uh, so they're not paying for the milk. They're paying for us to take care of their cows is how it works. Mm -hmm. And we had the, uh, farm to consumer legal defense fund. Uh, we're members of that and they helped us write some paperwork at the beginning and, uh, our customers signed that paperwork. And so that just shows that they're owners of the herd basically and, uh, are paying us to take care of it. So, it's pretty simple, and uh, and we like it the way it is. Uh, it helps us to plan for sales. It's sort of like a CSA because yeah, we know each week what the demand's going to be and how much milk we're going to sell, and it sort of helps ma- manage the sales end of it. Yeah, our customers, uh, you know, some of some of the people that want to become members, um, they're like, "Wow, that's a hassle," you know, to to have to do all that. And we actually really like it because, you know, if we didn't do that, we might have milk just sitting out there in the fridge that nobody's coming to buy, you know, so it's sort of pre-sold the way that it's run through the herd shares. So we don't mind it, even though it is more work on our end, but we do get close with our members. It's nice to, uh, last year we had like an ice cream social during the summer and um, uh, we had a, a Thanksgiving meal with them and that kind of thing. So it's just, it's nice to be able to form some closer relationships with people that we see every week like that and they're not just you know customers that come by whenever they want to you know that kind of thing yeah and it's allowed for some bartering too i know we trade milk for some things and uh that's been pretty cool Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's nice all right a couple more questions for you before we get off here um one of the questions i know a lot of people are going to ask is okay i have a cow i've been milking a cow and i have all this milk But what are some things for those people who are interested in getting into a herd share? What are some supplies they might need for the people who maybe already have a cow? But then what are supplies that the people who don't have a cow yet might need? Yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple, really. It depends on your demand. I mean, for us, we have a ton of jars. I'd say start with that because each customer, if they get one gallon, that's four jars because you have to have the two sets of jars for the current gallon and then the two sets of jars for next week's milk. 
So each gallon sold is four jars. So that's one thing that we didn't start with enough of. We've ordered jars several times and there's been a shortage of jars. Right. And uh, so that, that's where I would start. Yeah. This growing over the past three years has been crazy to try to get jars. So, you know, we there was times where we were like, Y'all got to bring your jars back, you know, yeah. and that's kind of, that's a requirement for our members anyways, is that they bring their jars from the week before back before they're allowed to pick their milk up. But occasionally, you know, it's got, we've gotten a little lax with it or whatever, but there's been times where we're like, no, this cannot, yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. we've got to have jars. We have nowhere to put this milk today. Yeah. So. so there's that, the jars, and then we have uh, several fridges. We have three fridges out there that we have for milk. One is, is for customers mainly, and then we have an overflow for customers, and then we have a, our personal fridge. So refrigeration is key. I would say an ice maker is key for, for quick chilling or some method of quick chilling the milk. I think that's very important. Um, ours is chilled within at least 15 minutes after milking typically. And that makes it last longer and stay fresh. I think having a place to uh, clean up everything is important. Uh, we were doing it in the house for a while, and Ooh, uh, yeah, it was a mess. <laughs> yeah, and it works, but it's a hassle for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I bet. Um, so we have a uh, we have an outdoor kitchen basically now with a, a nice stainless sink and drying rack and everything now, and that's where that's where we clean up. So. Yeah, that's, that feels very important. Yes. A good milker, and I don't have a lot of experience with milkers, but we did order one from Molasti. Uh, we've had it about a year, I guess, haven't we? Mm-hmm. And haven't had any problems with it. It's very user-friendly and simple to use and pretty, mm-hmm. I mean, it's expensive, no doubt, but um, for a herd share, it's it's fairly uh, uh, inexpensive, honestly. Yeah, if you're, it, yeah the herd share will, yeah, will pay for the For what you get out of it. Yeah. And if you have more than one cow, it's probably worth a machine. Uh, honestly, mm-hmm. we milk we milked one cow for uh, what two or three years, mm-hmm. and it would take me forty five minutes to an hour every day to milk milk one cow. And then we went to the machine, and I could milk six cows in the same amount of time. So that was a no brainer. Mm-hmm. It's just it's a lot more to well, not I wouldn't say a lot more to clean up, but it does take a little bit longer because mm-hmm. you are cleaning more equipment and everything. Right. But, and then filters, we filter the milk, right. so filters and um, and funnels and, and mm-hmm. things like that. Is that about it? Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, we have like the iodine teak dip for the cows and cleaning supplies and things like that. But uh, yeah, the main thing is the labor. I mean... The equipment and the and once you have the equipment, it's, you're pretty set. It's just the labor and the monotonous work. You know, I've, I've got to do this on Sunday mornings before church, and <laughs> you know all that stuff. So yeah, um, being all in, part. right? <laughs> that's yes. right. That's right. Yeah, there are definitely days, especially in the summer when it's a hundred degrees, and, uh, and you know it's very hard to go out and have to milk those cows. Yeah, but, it's uh, always the summer that gets us. Well, yeah. the the winter is too but the, the summer is really hard because it everyone gets really tired um you know we're not in our routine for school so it's a little more like can't we just sleep in today and that yeah. kind of thing and so it uh yeah it definitely takes a commitment to do it but yeah yeah okay so last question what do you recommend for people when they want to fill a herd share so there are a lot of people getting started um, and they're wondering how can they fill those herd shares? What are your recommendations in that? Um, whether it's marketing or where they can put their listing, um, what would you recommend they, they get started with? Well, I've seen, you know, there's some Facebook groups that like homesteading Facebook groups that I see people uh, kind of advertise in. But I think most of the time, if people in your area find out you have a cow, then you're not going to really be lacking for, uh, for business. But, um, I know for us, like there's been times where, you know, we've gotten more cows and so we had more of a supply, but we were a little bit lacking in, in our members. So we would, that's, I mean, really that's when we listed on realmilk.com and our, I mean, it really exploded after that. And right now we have a very lengthy waiting list. Um, so we are, we're advocating for people around us to get cows so that yeah. we can, you know, share this. And, you know, it, I, I believe it is a good, a good business if this is like, you know, Adam and I say we will never go without a milk cow. I mean, we just, 
we just won't. Um, whether we're milking it or one of our kids is milking it and we're sharing in that with them or whatever. So, you know, we, we feel like it's a good a good business, especially I, we love what it's it's teaching our children and everything. So, and hopefully one day we'll get to pass it on to them and mm-hmm. not, don't be so hands-on with it maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the realmilk.com was what really turned it up for us, you know. Seems like it. Yeah, it was driving traffic to our farm website, and we were getting multiple messages a day, mm-hmm. uh, and and really still are getting a yeah. lot of messages a day. Not that everyone follows through with it, but we do get a lot of inquiries about it. Yeah, so mm-hmm. it's been a blessing. Awesome. All right. Well, is there anything else you want to share with our HOA podcast audience before we get off this podcast recording? I think we've covered everything. Mm-hmm. I- Everybody needs a cow. Everybody needs a cow. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, everybody yeah. needs a cow. Huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's worth it. It's worth the commitment. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yes. All right, guys. Well, thank yeah. you for joining me for this week's episode. We've gotten a lot of information out to our audience, at least to get them started with a herd share or where to get them looking, which is amazing. Um, you guys can check out the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. They also offer services. If you sign up, it's very inexpensive. They are not sponsoring this episode. We're just plugging them because they do offer legal services. Like Adam and Michelle said, if you become a member, they will put together your herd share paperwork for you. And it's a pretty awesome process um, just to have that kind Mm -hmm. of legal backup for you as you get started. So as always, all the information we talked about today and links to all of Adam and Michelle's uh, information and farm and herd share will be linked in the show notes of this episode. Uh, You can read it on YouTube or the podcast, or you can go to our website, homesteadersofamerica.com, where you can actually read a transcript of this podcast if you want to go back and kind of look things over. Thanks for joining us this week, guys. Have a good one. Hey, thanks for taking the time to listen to this week's Homesteaders of America episode. We really enjoyed having you here. We welcome questions and you can find the transcript and all the show notes below or on our Homesteaders of America blog post that we have up for this podcast episode. Don't forget to join us online with a membership or just to read blog posts and find out more information about our events at homesteadersofamerica.com. We also have a YouTube channel and follow us on all of our social media accounts to find out more about homesteading during this time in American history. All right, have a great day and happy homesteading.